Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Thank you so much, Zahid, for hosting the previous uh, four sessions. I hope you've all had a, a wonderful time listening to all the wonderful speakers that we've had on so far. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Concordia Forum, of course, is an annual transatlantic retreat for senior Muslim leaders from politics, media, and the corporate world. Uh, normally, we would hold a physical retreat, but now we're, of course, doing these weekly Zoom distancing sessions, and we have a packed program today. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, next two uh, speakers. Uh, we have Jonathan Friedland from, from The Guardian, a uh, very well-known British political columnist, and of course, Rosanna Allen Khan, Shadow Minister for Mental Health and Cabinet Member. Um, Jonathan will be speaking to Rosanna. I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to give a more, more detailed introduction and take things from here. Over to you, Jonathan. On mute. There we are. Uh, thank you, Madassa. Um, delighted to be here, as it were, admittedly in my own home, but as part of this Concordia Forum. Uh, it's very good to, to be here. Uh, and as you say, we have delighted, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Dr. Rosina, Rosanna Allen Khan. And the crucial word there, in a way, Rosanna, if I can see you, there you are, um, is doctor. I mean, you know, we're going to talk about your politics and, and, and your very recent and for some in politics, astonishing recent achievements uh, arriving in this position as the runner up in the Labour deputy leadership contest. We're going to talk about that. But I just thought, first off, you are a physician and you have recently, and this has caused a lot of uh, attention, you recently did return to the front line. You returned to uh, urgent medical care in, I think, St. George's Hospital here in London. And I just thought it would be fascinating for people to hear because this is obviously a global phenomenon we're all dealing with. What you saw, what your experience of, uh, of, of, of coronavirus up front in the hospital environment was. So... Rosanna, welcome. Perhaps give us an answer to that. Thank you. Asalaamu Alaikum. Hello, everyone. What an honour it is to be here. I could not be more excited to be joining you today. Uh, thank you so much to, uh, you know, everyone for being here and to uh, Madassa for organising and obviously to Jonathan for hosting this session. Wow, some big topics at the moment. And, um, you know, for me, I, it wasn't really a return as such, rather than... Um, really a dropping of my campaign to be deputy leader of the Labour Party and changing my focus to frontline medicine because I've never really left. Um, many of you won't be that familiar with me but I only became an MP in 2016 uh, in June when I won the by-election for the seat vacated by Sadiq Khan and that's my home seat. I have no plans for politics whatsoever I had been working in, in the NHS on the front line as, as, as an emergency medicine specialist, and I had a career spanning 10 years working in the field of humanitarian medicine. Um, and I have continued to actually do that in a large capacity while, while being an MP. But the, the um, coronavirus outbreak uh, took hold here in the UK. We were about a month before the end of the deputy leadership contest, which everyone thought I was a little bit mad running for in the first place, but that's another story which we can come to. And I thought the appropriate thing to do would be to join my colleagues on a more frequent basis than I have been already and go back to the emergency department and see patients there. And I think it was really good to do that, not just on a practical level, to stand shoulder to shoulder with my colleagues, but to actually bring some of the really important messages home and into the media which was you know things for example like the virus doesn't discriminate we were hearing so much about it being mainly the elderly that were affected but what i was seeing when i went straight back to work was that people who are normally fit and well in their 30s and 40s were coming in very sick and many of them were not making it and that was that was quite difficult to deal with um, myself and many of my colleagues who we were seeing people coming in who were our age um, who, were, who were not making it and you know leaving behind young children so the real push was to um, fight for the public to come to grips with the fact that we really needed social distancing uh, no group of people were immune and so those are some of the main challenges to begin with. Well, there's <coughs> huge interest here in Britain at the moment in this account that has appeared today in the Sunday Times newspaper really charting the failings in terms of the UK government and how it handled 
the coronavirus and <clears throat> we might get into some of the detail of that but just first i just thought your your particular view of it actually at the coal face as it were you know your you your colleagues were you sufficiently equipped there's been a big controversy here about the lack of personal protective equipment uh, in, in terms of masks and gowns, etc. Did you and your colleagues have that? Did you have enough in terms of ventilators? Obviously, we get the big picture, the statistics. I'm just curious there on the ward, as it were, did you all have enough kit? No, we didn't. Uh, and I would like to preface what I'm about to describe by saying that, yes, I am a, a politician, but my aim is not to score political points. Uh, my aim is to just tell you the facts as I saw it and, and highlight where we will need to learn going forward. And there were some huge failings. And in fact, um, what I experienced on the front line was there was not enough. Uh, there is not enough now. Um, I was on BBC uh, Breakfast yesterday talking about difficult conversations I had with my colleagues who are extremely stressed. They are feeling as though they are lambs to the slaughter. And I actually um, used a PMQ that I was really, really grateful to have managed to get. I, I've only ever had two in my entire career, and one of them was in March. And This and being I a actually, question to the Prime Minister, just yes, for people who are not from sorry. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm one of these unlucky people that never gets picked uh, out of a raffle or out of a draw, and that includes for a Prime Minister's question. But I got picked in, in, in March. Um, some may say that that was because, you know, God wanted these questions asked. But I asked the Prime Minister, I said to him, where was the forward planning for the personal protective equipment when we knew we had our first case in the UK in January? Where was the plan for mass testing and scaling up testing? I mean, we've just seen this week that we are the lowest um, in terms of testing globally, in terms of the numbers of people that have been tested. So I asked where the forward planning was for that and I urged him to adopt um, social distancing measures that were more than just suggestions that were actual real tangible recommendations and in fact uh, you know mandatory um, because look at the end of the day nobody should be going to work putting their life on the line and unfortunately we have lost colleagues um, on our NHS front line and in the care sector we haven't been properly protected. We do know that the Prime Minister did miss five COBRA meetings. There were multiple opportunities to be part of personal protective equipment, PPE, buying schemes that were not taken up. There were plenty of people around the country offering um, PPE to be made. Offer, we, we have a number of companies in the UK who are able to produce the tests. They hadn't been engaged. And so I think on, on the front line, the real upset was we heard, we heard in all these statements that we have every day, and of course the press conferences are very, very useful, very helpful, but there is no way for anybody else to really ask the questions. And so we were told we had the PPE that we needed and all it would take is a Herculean effort to distribute it. So there we were waiting for it. And then when it wasn't forthcoming, we were like told, well, well, that you know, there is a global shortage. So, you know, so people were were like writing to me at three, four in the morning. I'm getting emails coming in saying I can't sleep. I have to do my shift tomorrow. My daughter's begging me not to go to work. Is it a Herculean distribution effort, or is it the fact we don't have any? We're now being asked not to wear gowns. We're being asked to reuse the gowns that we have. So these were sorts of messages that were coming through, and unfortunately, I met. Well, the front lines feel pretty let down. So you've d detailed that these these failings, as I say, that in the Sunday Times of London today, there's a litany of them. One thing I'm interested in your perspective on is the why question. Why it is that this set of people who've been in charge have failed. You could look at the United States and in a way it's sort of obvious because in Donald Trump you have a figure who is upfront about his sort of dismissal of science and facts and data and and yet here it's harder to put a, one's finger on why exactly this government, Boris Johnson and his ministers, would have failed, as you said, a you know, series of opportunities to intervene, five meetings of COBRA, which is like the UK equivalent of the kind of situation room that he didn't attend. What's your answer to yourself almost of why this government has, if, if these accounts, and you've echoed it of what you've seen on the front line, 
fail to get a grip on this early and strongly? I, I'd want to be really careful when answering a question like this, not to apportion blame in any way that would be unfair. What I can say is that there has been a lack of transparency when questions have been asked. The answers haven't been forthcoming. And I think ultimately the reasons for some of the things you're asking will come out in the wash if there is an inquiry later on. So what and, I can and most share, people think there will be a huge public inquiry when this yeah, is Yeah, and I think, I think there needs to be. Um, I really think there needs to be. And yes, this is about everybody from all parties pulling together, coming together um, in the national interest. And of course that is important. But there, were, there have been some huge questions that I've asked um, very publicly, which has had full public backing and backing from journalists, to which answers haven't been forthcoming. And some of those are, firstly, I wrote a letter to Matt Hancock many weeks ago, which I published, sent to him, and have never received an answer thus far, regarding our capacity to test. I said, I understand this is, this is a very difficult time. I understand that. Um, you know, I mean, some people say we were warned about this, but I'm, you know, even if we weren't warned, um, it, it, this this is a huge, this is a huge crisis, which was always very difficult to forward plan for. But who are we engaging internationally on the tests that we need? We know that there are six different companies within the UK who can manufacture the tests that we need. What are we doing to engage those? You know, we're here to support you, Mr. Hancock, you know, but what are you doing? Please, can you let us know? Um, and never received an answer. Yeah, Another yeah. question which I have been banging on about, um, and I feel very, very, very strongly about as a clinician and as somebody with a public health master's who is specialized in global health and knows about these things, I have been very, very um, open about my alarm at the fact that we are only adopting a seven day isolation um, strategy here. So here in the UK, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, many of which are still being discovered actually, um, you know, we're seeing new things every day. So if you have any of the established symptoms that we know about, you are allowed to leave your house seven days after the onset of symptoms. Whereas the rest of the world and the WHO recommendations are that you do not leave self-isolation until 14 days after your symptoms have stopped. Anybody on this call today, any of our good friends here today, if you know anyone that has had the virus, you will know that very, very often um, you can be feeling unwell for a matter of weeks. And though you can have a persistent cough that lasts for a very long time, you are most definitely still contagious um, in many, many instances, seven days after the onset of symptoms. We know that you can be contagious even before you start exhibiting symptoms. But no one has answered my questions. I have been very polite. Um, I have been um, rather determined in getting a response. And I have said, look, just show us the evidence. All we're asking for is not, not to be difficult, but to say, can you show us the evidence? If you have evidence that this virus has a different pathogenesis here in the UK compared to the rest of the world, therefore meaning it is safe for doctors. I know doctors who've gone back to work still coughing seven days after symptoms have started. How is that safe? If it so, is, I will hold my hands up and say, fine, but can you show the evidence? And no one is being transparent. All right, and we just had a, a participant from Canada say, it's very surprising what you're saying, it is 14 days self-isolation in Canada, exactly as you said. Now, you tweeted yesterday that you, or maybe in the last 24 hours anyway, that you feel your own sadness turning to anger now. And it struck me, Labour is now under a new leader, Keir Starmer, who said from the outset that he was going to engage in what he called constructive opposition in terms of coronavirus. And I'm just wondering if there are people now listening to what you've just been saying and reading these accounts who will say, maybe what's needed now is a little less constructive and a little more opposition. That, you know, maybe you now need to take the gloves off, as it were, and step up 
and you know you were saying that you've asked these questions you've been polite i'm just wondering if now, if you and your colleagues in labor now need to get into a more uh, adversarial posture because this is getting so serious and clearly you've just set out it seems to be so badly mishandled I don't know what Keir's plans are as a result of some of the revelations that are in today's um, Sunday Times. Um, I don't know what he's planning to do. We have a shadow cabinet meeting um, in, in two days time. Um, and, you know, myself and the rest of the health team are, are being pretty vocal. In fact, I thought I probably had to tone it down a little bit when I joined the shadow cabinet um, because obviously I was, I was able to be a bit freer before I joined that um, in, in my... In, in my sort of language, not not that it was any different, but uh, but every every message you know has to be has to be tempered because we were told you know and it's absolutely right and proper that when you are in the shadow cabinet when you speak when you tweet you you are tweeting on behalf of the party um, so you know we can't really go rogue I I know that he is is upset um, I do think that it's prudent that we we. <sighs> take a stance that is appropriate to the new information that we are receiving and um, I think that it is not beneficial for anyone to get into a political spat um, particularly as obviously we know that this virus you know, affects everybody it's about a concerted effort um, we want transparency but I do think that where we're not getting that on a repeated basis it's it's important for any opposition to be an effective opposition and push for the answers. Let's talk a little bit and then just sort of, sort of pivot to you and the party, as you just mentioned. As you said, you were elected not very long ago, less than four years ago, in yeah. this circumstance was created as, you know, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, vacated the seat in yeah. shooting and you stepped, you know, in a by-election or special election, um, you became the Member of Parliament. Then, I mean, you know, in a very short space of time, there was this contest to be the deputy leader of the party. You threw your hat in the ring and yeah. in the end was the runner up. You came very yeah. close. Now, I know, I know I can see on your face there your own still almost surprise <laughs> at that outcome. And there were people who observed politics who were surprised. But I, I think you've been questioned about it and you've said, you know, you put it down to partly you had a very good team, a very small team, but they worked really well. But I, I'm just interested. Beyond that, and obviously it goes down to it's a tribute to your own campaigning skills, which I think is a big part of the story. But what, what sort of chord in the party do you think you were striking? In other words, almost if you were doing my job and you were analysing the politics of it, as if it wasn't your own campaign, how, what would your reading of it be that you came so close? You didn't win, obviously, but you gave the, the eventual winner, Angela Rayner, a very good race. What's your own sort of almost detached analysis of, of what chord within Labour you were striking with that? campaign well I'm, I'm going to give you a really honest answer here because you know this isn't this isn't a media interview I feel like I'm amongst you know friends and colleagues who've all had different different career trajectories in their life and I massively put it down to my determination never ever to give up um, yes I had been I mean if you look at the actual years at which I, I, I'd, I'd been an MP for three and a half years. Um, I had run three elections in three years, a by-election and two general elections, um, turned my uh, marginal seat into a safe seat um, because I never ever gave up. And people said to me right at the beginning, you have absolutely no chance of getting the MP nominations because here the process is now, you have to get your MP and MEP colleagues to nominate you. Then you need to get enough of those to then get to the next stage, which is where you have to get constituency Labour Party groups to nominate you, and then you get onto the final ballot. If you can get through that process, and many people in the leadership and deputy leadership dropped out at various stages, you then go before the members and you have lots of hustings and you do media appearances. So people said, well, um, we can see from polls that at the start, 5% of the Labour Party know who you are. You've been here five minutes. Um, you are a mixed race Muslim, you are a female, you're young, you have no chance. And I said, well, you know, when I was growing up and we were poor and we didn't have any heating and we didn't have any food and everybody told me I'd never become a doctor and I'd never amount to anything, I didn't listen to them then. So why should I listen to them now? I'm just going to go for it and I'll get as far as I'm meant to get because 
the only reason I stood um, is not because I wanted to become better known in the party or I wanted to get a bit of life experience. Don't get me wrong, it is, it is very hard with two very young children, um, you know, being, being of my um, ethnicity, my gender, um, you know, being, being a Labour politician, it's very difficult to, to throw your hat in the ring like this. It's a very difficult campaign to run, particularly when you're going on big TV shows here and everyone's pointing to you on 5% and saying you've got absolutely no hope. The reason I did it is because I thought there really needed to be room for somebody to be up there saying, I'm not a career politician. I came from a background which is like so many people in the country today, really poor, really scared, really insecure, failed all my exams, um, went to Cambridge age 24 to read medicine because I didn't believe in the word no and I never gave up. There's got to be a room in politics to not be tribal, to just believe in yourself, believe in good values and put your name forward. And so when people said, don't bother, I said, well, thanks for the conversation. I'll, 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 I'll keep going, thanks. Just tell I, me, I, just, I, I, just, I, I want to pick you up on one thing, which I just thought was so interesting. You said uh, some people you know, were counselling you not to do it, including saying as one of the reasons, look, you're a mixed race Muslim, as <laughs> if that would, and I'm very interested in that because Labour would pride itself on being very open, progressive, uh, anti-racist party. Are you saying there were people in Labour who thought the fact that you are, your words, a mixed race Muslim, would be a hindrance to getting elected to that post? I was told by MPs, more than one, some of them BME MPs, you have no hope of getting the MP nominations, you are a Muslim. No Muslim has ever done it, you won't do it. And that underpinning that must have been a sense that there was prejudice, even Islamophobic prejudice, within the upper reaches of the Labour Party. Not sure I'd go so far as to say that that would be putting words into people's mouths but I can tell you I was made very aware of what I should do with myself and it was not keeping on going <laughs> yeah. but I was saying that um, I got the nominations with ease and enough people believed in my steely determination they came to the to the, to the MP hustings it's not easy I can tell you to to be in a hustings against six other incredible candidates who are shadow cabinet members who've been there for many, many years, who are really well known, have massive profiles in front of 200 of your colleagues and try and justify why you should be one of the leaders of their party. But somehow, somehow you did it. resonated. They, well, they resonated. And it's not, it's not because I'm special. It's not because of anything other than I just stood there and I said, I, there has to be a place in our party not to be tribal, not to have to put a label onto yourself, you know, by, by be, uh, you know, are you on the far left? Are you in progress? What? I'm just, a, I'm just a young woman who grew up, like so many people in this country grow up, being made to feel like life wasn't for you. A few people believed in me along the way. I finally, eventually, once I lost a lot of the, you know, personal psychological baggage that I had to deal with growing up, you know, some very difficult circumstances, I started to believe in myself and thought, hold on a minute, and I even said this, I said this on Mar, I said this on Sophie Ridge when they, when they pointed out where I was in the, <laughs> you know, where I was. Um, when you were trailing you know, quite badly. But... Yeah, I was, I was right at the bottom. They said, and they said, oh, you know, is there any point? And I just said, if one young person turns on the TV now, this Sunday morning, and hears from, from me that it doesn't matter if you fail everything in your life. It doesn't matter if you feel like you have no hope. You just pick yourself up and you keep on going because what defines you is not whether you fall, it's how you pick yourself up. If one young person hears me say that on the TV today, then I'm a winner. And I'm a winner just by being on your show and being able to get that message out. And it worked, I mean, it worked. I, be, I, be, I beat shadow cabinet members. I beat people who were part of some big political groups. And I gave the front runner who started off on 67% who was meant to win outright, I, I made her go to the final round. And that I believe on, personally, I, I have a very you know, strong belief in God. I, I think he wanted me to get those messages out there for as long as I could. And then the story became not, not about anything else, but about the person who didn't give up, about the person who just believed in, in goodness in, in all the forms that it comes, whoever you are, I mean, you know, I was asked questions on TV, like, would you work with the Conservatives to, to, you know, to benefit the NHS? Of course I'd work with the Conservatives to benefit the NHS. 
I'd work with anybody to help anyone. And those messages actually resonated with members who knew. <laughs> Very good. And Nuzhat has um, texted in a message saying, you got my vote because you didn't seem to be a career politician, had real life Thank experience you. and represented me as a Muslim female mum. Uh, and, and maybe it says also and doctor. Anyway, well done for keeping going. Lots of people agreeing with that. Um, this point you're making about, um, uh, well, actually, why don't we pick up the, one of the last things you said, which I thought was, was interesting and quite rare to hear from a politician, talking about your own belief in God. And it interests me what you think being a Muslim adds to your place in politics. Uh, the, the very first time we met, you and I were across the table at, on a TV uh, politics program, and you were talking about a trip you had made to, uh, visiting Rohingya Muslims. Yes. Uh, and that was a big issue for you. So that may be the, one part of the answer, but, but you seem to go to something even deeper than that before by mentioning invoking the name of God and your own belief. So just tell us about what that does for you. And I think maybe for people who are not from Britain watching this, it, they may be not aware of how rare it is actually for people of any uh, faith background to talk about faith in British politics. It's not like America here. Politicians, politicians almost always avoid it. Famously, Alistair Campbell, who advised Tony Blair, said, we don't do God. But there you were mentioning it uh, just a moment ago. So what, does it, what difference does it make to your, uh, the way you do politics? I think it makes a difference to the way I do life, actually. Um, I, I, I grew up having many days where I didn't know whether I'd be alive the next day or not. And that's a story for another day, maybe another life. But I, I, I wasn't, so I, I was born into a mixed family and I, I was given the choice what religion to be. Loads of people assume that because I am Muslim, I must have been forced into it. And um, because why would you possibly want to choose to be Muslim is what everybody says to me. I said, well, like Islam found me actually. Um, and it was from a very basic, uh, a very basic question that I asked when I was seven and people wanted to put labels on me. People wanted to say, well, you know, you're half Polish, half Pakistani, you're half, you're half Catholic, half Muslim. What are you? And I realized that really early on, people wanted to put me in a box because it helped them. And, and I didn't understand this, you know, like it was the 80s and, and uh, you know, everyone wanted to label me. So I felt the, the push to need to understand who I was and what I was really early on, um, even though I didn't, you know, I didn't really understand much about it. So I used to just ask um, people, priests, imams, uh, you know, people from all religions, a very basic question. Um, and, I, and I chose my religion based on the answer. And I will come to the rest of, of, of the question that you asked me in a moment, but I think it's important to highlight this bit. Um, I would say everybody in my family that I love believes different things. Who's going to go to heaven? And it was only the Imam that said to me, actually, if your mum is a good person, even though she doesn't know about Islam, even though your dad never asked her to be Muslim, even though she's alone and there's no Muslims in the house, you know, um, even though if your mum isn't Muslim, she can still go to heaven. If she's a good person, that's all that matters in the eyes of God. That was enough for me. And it was the only religion that said that to me. I mean, I knew I believed in God. That was never, that was never a thing. Um, I went to a Church of England school. I was in the Brownies. I used to go to church parade. Um, you know, I, I used to feel actually quite uncomfortable when 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 I went to the mosque when I was younger um, to learn uh, uh, like Quran Sharif because at the time I was the only mixed child there, and I you know I I, I just just generally I just had no Islamic influence in my life whatsoever. It was just simply the question. Half of my family believe one thing, half of the other. I want everyone to go to heaven. And it was the imam that told me that. So, so from, that, from that day, I thought, well, if I have to label myself, I'm labeling myself as a Muslim. And I was very happy to do that my whole life. I, I, was, I had a very strong belief in God, even though my mum, she was a Christian, raising two, you know, two children who were chosen to be Muslim in her home. My brother's five years younger than me. We both chose to be Muslim for that reason because we honestly believed that everybody in our lives would go to heaven, regardless of what they believed, if they were good people. And I know it might sound very basic, but when you're seven, that means a lot. Um, it really, really does. And um, what my belief in God led me to believe from a very, very difficult upbringing is my mum always used to say that if we, so, so I used to say to my mum, why is life so hard? And she used to say that there are people for whom life is harder. And you just, you just trust in God and know that it will all be okay one day. 
So I used to pray at night. I used to just say, God, if we get out of this life, then just use my life to help other people. I don't mind how you do it. Um, I'm not fussy. Um, just use, use, use me. Just use, use my life. And he did. And so when I failed all my A-levels and couldn't get into medical school because we were poor and, you know, I failed them because things were so bad at home. The school didn't ask why. I was just there, 18, no clue, no money, no nothing. You know, to go to Cambridge, age 24, to read medicine, to be with the people that I was with, to learn from the professors that I learned from, I'm like, yeah, this is God. Then when I, then when I you know, I, I, I committed my life to humanitarian medicine, I've been held at gunpoint, knife point, uh, you know, I've been in war zones. And I've, my belief in God, to answer your question, I know I've gone the long way around, it, he takes away my fear. That's what he does. He takes away my fear. So when I find myself 30 years old at gunpoint or knife point at a checkpoint trying to get goods over the border to feed the people that I need them to get to, he takes away my fear. When I want to run in a by-election because somehow he's told me that that's what I should do because I can help a lot of people that way and someone says, you'll never get it, um, you know, there's 120 people going for this, I go, well, I'm not afraid. And then when it goes to being deputy leader and people say you're never going to do it, I just say, God, if you mean it to happen, make it your will. If you don't, don't worry. But he takes away my fear. It's the removal of fear and the, the, the absolute faith that I will be where I'm meant to be on my life path is how God influences my life. I, I say a little prayer before anything scary, any speech I have to make, I just say, dear God, um, please help anything that I say to touch the people that need to be touched by this and for good outcomes to come. And, and, I, and I'm very comfortable talking about it, actually. I can see that. Did you make that prayer just before this session today? No, I made a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about, you, you said we'll talk about it in another life, but I can't sort of leave it. You mentioned right at the beginning of that answer that there was a point in your life where you literally didn't know whether you would be alive the following day. Yeah. There was just just explain to us what, that, what, what you're referring to there. Just, just like many people, um, yeah, I had a very, uh, a, a, a very volatile upbringing for, for a number of reasons that was shrouded in insecurity, um, violence, and uh, poverty. And, and it was, it, it, that focuses your mind. And sometimes the only thing you can do is believe in God. To, uh, it's interesting actually because my husband, my husband found that he, I mean, he, he. He converted, um, but didn't believe in God when I met him because he'd gone the other way. He thought, if there is a God, then why would this be happening? Because that was his experience. Um, and then found God later. For me, it was like, God is the person who can get me out of this situation. So that was where my faith in God came from, from an early age. And I just think it, yeah, your life experiences shape you so much, don't they? And, and that's as well why I, I guess, I had a real issue with some of the tribal stuff in the Labour Party when it came to where are you? Who are you? We need to understand who you are. How far left are you? How far right are you? I'm like, whoa, you know, but when you when you have um, kids that need to go and use food banks, when you have people who can't access their cancer chemotherapy on time um, and get the life saving treatment they need, they don't care about left, right or centre. They just need a government that works. And for some people, their 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 life gets changed. I mean, I mean, you know, for me, it was it was um, it was the Labour Party uh, changing policy that meant kids like me could end up going somewhere like Cambridge to study medicine. But I have other colleagues; their life chances came through a Conservative government. We're, we're, like we're all good people. We're all trying to do yes. good things. Well, like the Imam said, we all get to heaven in the end if we're good. This is it. You know, um, this I is mean, yeah. It seems like a life <laughs> life lesson to you. But well, just, um, just try your best. It's not, you know, like, you know, like he wasn't trying to say that everybody is is you know you know but perfect. He, it was just like you, you you just do your best. And that's, that's no, that's what I meant. Now listen, yeah. Rosanna, we've got I've got two more questions for you, and then lots of questions are coming in, and I know there's oh, people who are going to want to come in. So why don't I just ask you these two quickly? I mean, well, then you'll you'll decide whether they're quick, but then, and then we'll go to other people. So the first one is you've mentioned this. Um, tribal thing and within labor i think the word somebody like me might use but factional um within labor and you've 
two or three times made very clear that you you're you don't want any part of that you're not part of that let me just ask you very quickly your reaction to this report that came out that leaked last week 860 pages long by the outgoing team the team that went out with jeremy corbyn saying that there were labor officials who were undermining the leadership at that time and particularly perhaps it was they who were to blame rather than jeremy corbyn over the uh, long-running anti-semitism question inside labor i mean you're a labor politician i ought to ask you about it so i'm asking you about it what do you think of all that that's quite absolutely gutted to be honest that's the word i would use i'm so deeply disappointed by all of that at a time when it's, it's time to press the reset button move on i think um very unhelpful for for people to leak private conversations nevertheless the content of those conversations is extremely damaging uh, for, for everyone involved and for the whole Labour movement, actually. Um, and so I'm glad that, you know, Keir and Angela are, are going to investigate it thoroughly. And I, and I honestly just wait the outcome of that. Um, it's hard to read things about your colleagues. To be honest, I, I didn't want to read too much because it was quite upsetting. Um, but I, it, it does nothing to help move us forward, does it? And I'm disappointed. Um, I'm disappointed that at a time when we should have had a week really sort of challenging uh, what's going on regarding COVID-19 and the management of that, that there was a lot of a lot of time taken dealing with the with the fallout of this. Yeah. And then the other question it, it was about the pandemic again, and that is historically when plagues have come people have tried to blame people for them, often outsiders. And there is a pattern over really a thousand years of history that plagues have been blamed on foreigners and people from outside and unwanted. And that has led to prejudice over many centuries. Do you have any worry that that will happen with this one? We're obviously still in the very first period, really. But do you worry that people will, at some point, with coronavirus turn to those who are different in whatever way and say somehow this is your fault? Yeah I am worried I'm really worried and I've seen it happening already if you look at some of the narrative coming out of America and um, you know calling it the Chinese virus, um, it's, it's, it's terrible and I actually have um, you know seen here in the UK we have um, a lot of a lot of people from the Chinese saying that they've experienced um, a lot of prejudice and I was even, in fact, in the early days of this, I was in um, a taxi driving the taxi. Um, this was obviously before lockdown. And, uh, and he said, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really worried about letting Chinese people into the taxi. I was like, oh, gosh, you know, it, it, we, we do have to worry. I mean, we are living in a time where xenophobia, um, homophobia, it's almost okay to say it because you can get a platform um you know trump you know says things like that you know nigel farage gets lots of you know lots and lots, lots of followers using that sort of language and i do worry um that we will see even more of um even more of potentially some damage issues but it's something that we all stand together and fight against and we have a duty i think as as politicians as members of our community as journalists to to call it out um and i think as well you know i'm i'm not chinese but i will get as angry as somebody being really discriminating someone chinese as i would about someone racially discriminating someone from eastern europe or pakistan I think we have a collective responsibility to, to really hold together on this. Thank you. So let's take some of these questions. First of all, I'm just going to give you relay ones that were sent through the chat uh, that has been coming through. So, for example, Shahid said, thanks so much for what you're doing, Rosina, one, Rosina, wonderful to hear from you. Lots of young people do not view politics as an ethical career choice, a job in which you cannot hold on to your own values. What's your view on this? And should young people? Be thinking of pursuing politics as a career choice and you mentioned yourself before that if one person saw you and thought okay maybe i've got a chance but here shahid's question is more pointed than that about politics which uh, he describes as not an ethical or saying anyway lots of young people do not view it as an ethical career choice what's your view 
I'll say it's as ethical as you make it. Um, I've broken the whip before on things that I feel principled about. Um, I know I have colleagues across the house who on point of principle have resigned, who have broken the whip. Um, and I think it's ever more important that young people from all sorts of backgrounds get involved in politics because we only, we only change how politicians uh, behave, look, sound, bike, um, and by being more reflective of our society, by having politicians who, who aren't afraid to stand up and say, I don't agree with going to war there. I I think you can hold on to your ethics if you choose to. Um, and I don't think, well, I think my, my deputy leadership campaign um, and my success taught me one thing. Including anti-Semitism, including um, not being factional. Um, there's an appetite for it. There's an appetite for it. I could honestly say what I genuinely thought on any topic um, that I thought was ethical. Um, and what did you be honest? And that was one of the things that people said that they liked and why they voted for me. Yeah. Um, a question from Mohammed Amin, who I think if people know, many people will know here, was involved obviously in Conservative Party politics, who says the UK needs the Labour Party to be a credible party of government. What does Rosanna think that the Labour Party needs to do to return to being a credible party of government? I think, I think it needs to um, really show that it deals with important things like anti-Semitism. I mean, there has to be absolutely no room for that in our party. It has to be taken extremely seriously, and I'm glad that Keir is doing that. And I think he's surrounded himself in the shadow cabinet by people who take that incredibly seriously. We make sure that there is no room for factionalism because that just divides us, makes us absolutely incapable of, of governing anyone properly. We need to become... We need to be seen, I believe, to be a more aspirational party. I think some of the messages that came out made people feel as though Labour wasn't an aspirational party, that it, there wasn't a place for them if they were someone like me who had come from poverty, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, gone on and achieved something. I think some people said, um, it was only the party for you if you used a food bank, um, but if you didn't use the food bank, it wasn't aspirational enough. And I think, we, I don't believe that was entirely true, but that was what people were led to believe. And I think we need to change that narrative, make it very clear that we do support business, we do support aspirations, um, because otherwise we won't connect, particularly with, with people, um, you know, in their 30s, 40s and 50s, who came from similar backgrounds mine, who have gone on to achieve things. I think the Labour Party needs to show they're, they're a party for everyone at all stages of your life. Very good. Um, we are having a few problems with sound. It's not um, just Salma Hamid who asked if it was only uh, her. I think we are having problems with sound. I, I looked at Madassa just in case there's anything we can do about that. But we'll, we'll forge ahead while, we're, while, we, while we can anyway. And let's just see. Um, the uh, Labour, well, uh, Labour Party has always had parties within it. How do you feel about these parties? That goes to you, the point we were discussing before about factionalism, but um, it doesn't seem to have gone even with the arrival of a new leader, does it? Well, I think we need to be very careful here when we're, when, we're, when we're talking about this. In any political party, the same with the, you know, exactly the same with the Conservatives, exactly the same with the Labour Party, you have a broad spectrum of Thoughts. I mean, you know, like the ERG and the Conservative Party doesn't represent all Conservative politicians in the same way as momentum in the Labour Party doesn't represent all Labour politicians. It's about having a broad church um, acknowledging and respect back the broad church. And so their thoughts and their, 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 their values and their idea as to how to take the country forward isn't welcome. Everything has to be part of the conversation. And it's very difficult to adhere to labelling. I think, you know, like some fantastic policies come from the far left and some fantastic policies come from what would be considered the right of the party. And I think if we, if we try and put ourselves into factions, 
it's almost like we can't recognize when a good suggestion comes from another part of the party. I think it's really important that as we have now, we have a front bench that reflects the broad church that we are as a Labour Party. Look, he's only been in a week, 10 days, give him, give him five minutes. You know, he's in the middle yeah. of a national crisis. I, I really do believe we are, we are on the up. But what he's done is he's ensured that he's kept that broad church of opinion there so that we can have um, respectful debate and discussion. And, you know, if somebody wants to tell me that other parties do not have um, you know, real sort of division of political opinion. I, I, well, I can't, I can't subscribe to that because we know that's not the case. Yeah. Let me see if there's others who would like to come in. You can, I, I don't have a full screen of everyone, but I mean, there might be a way where you either wave or uh, uh, somehow make yourself known. Um, or, or is it, or Madasso, should we just rely on the chat, do you think? What is the best way of doing it? Um, we can we can ask people to there is a way that people can put their hand up actually um i can't i can't don't seem to be able to see everyone's face at once but um but if there's a way that you're able to see more people then we can definitely do it that way um if some if people have a question for us and otherwise i'm very happy to keep going because i've got lots <laughs> <laughs> well i wanted to add something actually um yeah. you were speaking about donald trump and the potential for um, the current political climate to enable extreme views and scapegoating, which Donald is obviously a, a master at. I, I'm not sure if you guys have seen, but last night he tw he tweeted a um, a tweet that uh, essentially questioned whether Muslims will do enough to keep inside their homes during Ramadan, and it was picked up by the media. And actually, he then went on to attack as he always does, uh, a few of the Muslim female congresswomen. We've got one of them on later on today, Ilhan Omar. Um, so he's already clearly using his pulpit to really bash minorities. And I'm, I'm now in Britain so far, they, I, I haven't seen a massive rise in that, but that would be of grave concern. Um, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just not convinced that all the different ingredients that have gone into the current political makeup uh, will position us well for for further divisiveness. So, I mean, I, I'm not expecting an answer, but I'm just kind of expressing a concern um, that we could very easily see this rapidly spiraling. You know, we're already talking about a depression. Uh, we've already had all the shenanigans around Brexit, the divisiveness. Many people are concerned that this could spiral out of control. I think, I think these are very legitimate concerns, particularly when you look at the mental health of the nation at the moment. Um, you know, people living in over their head. Um, and during these times of insecurity, sometimes people look for someone to blame. They feel angry, they feel frustrated. And I think it's very easy to blame immigrant populations, particularly when there is underlying ill feeling anyway. I mean, if I, if I even just look at a test of where we are nationally, all I need to do is to go on and say something even perfectly sensible, perfectly uniting, but anyone that is racist, loves Tommy Robinson, or supported a hard Brexit, um, you know, because I mean, um, just, just, you know, just an interview about going back and working in the hospital. Nothing divisive at all. Um, so I. Being ever more frustrated, and they're worried, and and they're scared, and their mental health is suffering. And I do worry that um, there there is a lot simmering under the surface. And 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 I think that it's, that's I do need the government deliver on some of the packages that they said they would do to support people. It should be easier to get universal credit than it is. Um, if people with small businesses need that security. You know, currently only 2% of people who are eligible for some of these uh, measures have been in receipt of it. 
So I think we need positive messaging. We need to know people, well, we, we, we have to help people know that they are supported as much as possible through this difficult time and see what we Thank you. Well, there are some problems with the sound from your end. Um, somebody suggested if you, if you turn your video off, I think the sound will improve. But I think that oh, might so be a problem because we do want to see you. So again, I'll, oh, I'll leave Madassa. Let, let me come a bit closer. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether that's it. It's, it feels as if there's insufficient um, bandwidth. But anyway, let's let's press oh, on because we, we might be all right. And Madassa will step in, I'm sure, if he feels there's another solution. Um, I wanted to, uh, you just mentioned about Brexit. And one of the things that has been rumbling along in the background is that the government still says they're going to not apply for an extension they, they that they are going to keep going um and uh leave on leave the european union you know with or without a deal on december the 31st i just wonder whether you that should become part of labor's constructive opposition to say almost look whatever you think about brexit we nobody the country collectively does not have a head for it while we're dealing with this pandemic and that for that reason alone, not, not leave or remain, but just simply because we've got our hands full, it should be delayed and, and that the government should apply for or certainly accept if offered an extension. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, so, sorry, can you hear me? Because it says I've got a little note on here saying my speaker isn't working. I can hear you can fine. You... I just every now and again, it sounds like it does when the sort of broadband is failing a bit. But right now we're OK. So let's keep going. You're OK. Yeah. Will you let me know if you're not? Of course okay. you are, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm I'm of the belief that it would be good to have an extension, um, most definitely, because I think that right now there is just so much insecurity on so many levels. And really importantly, we do need to be able to be in Parliament properly scrutinising everything that happens. And while we are currently working out how to do a virtual parliament, and, and we will, we certainly won't be able to apply the right level of um, scrutiny to everything that we ordinarily would have. I mean, even things like the immigration bill, we can't properly you know, debate it at the moment. And that is unhealthy. As far as I understand it. Thank you. There's a question that's just come in. Before I get to that, uh, again, I want to pick up something that interests me. You spoke two or three times about, and you talked us through very um, movingly, actually, about how you chose Islam. It wasn't a foregone conclusion for you because of your mixed background. Often when people talk about people from mixed background, they imagine the hostility coming from one group, in this case, perhaps people outside uh, Islam. But I'm wondering whether you, your experience, how it's been from fellow Muslims about the fact that you have this mixed background and whether you encounter, if you like, prejudice from within as well as from without because of that heritage that you have and that you talked about before. Um, I, I wouldn't say it was from Muslims per se for being Muslim. I'd say I've experienced it a bit more from been there for example things like um oh well Sadiq was full Pakistani you're only half we'll have to think of some other way to sell you <laughs> um or or um certainly certainly some people not inviting me to things because they didn't think I you know it, it's cool for me to some things that some of my um, fully uh, Pakistani colleagues were invited to. So it took about two and a half years for the Pakistani commissioner to invite me to anything and that's only because they changed commissioner. <laughs> and he was like, why, you know, why hasn't she been invited? And it's, and it's not coming from a bad place. I think it's just coming from an understanding that many generations, I mean, when I was growing up, um, missing heritage and marriages and it's and it's wonderful um but uh, but a lot of people didn't know really how to handle um you know a blonde polish mum with a pakistani man and some of those prejudices from growing up have moved on with people in generations and i think also sometimes people assume that because i am mixed race that i would have wouldn't have an interest in pakistan um, which is not the case at all. 
so um, you know, people people just sort of assume that I don't identify with it in any way. That I wouldn't want to identify with it in any way, and I just say I'm not half something and half something else. I am Polish and I am Pakistani, um, and I'm proudly Polish. You know, I, I I identify with Polish things. I speak Polish. I go to Poland all the time. My children are learning Polish, but I'm also Pakistani, and just because I have one parent from Pakistan rather than two. You know, beautiful and wonderful, and um, but but that's fine. And I, I, I don't think anything has ever come from a bad place. It's no. just come from people not understanding and not knowing, and, and just not knowing what to do with the information. What, what you're describing there, I think, a lot of people from mixed backgrounds would identify with, which is simultaneously being regarded as both too Muslim and not Muslim enough at the same time. But having that experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but I've also, yeah, I mean, I've had it. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because it just, it just depends who is, who's talking to you. It doesn't matter that I speak Polish. My mum's Polish. My mum was really quite famous in Poland when she lived there. Um, she was in a girl band, and um, it, none of that matters because I don't. Even though I look exactly like her, um, because I don't fit their idea of what a Polish is. Possibly be Polish, um, and you know I go I go and I do a lot with the Foreign Office in Poland, and um, I, I, I even want to do it. The um, achievements of Polish. I'm going to read you what um, a, uh, a question. Some, first of all, somebody identified with what you said. Akila replied saying, really feel this being neither fully Pakistani nor fully German. There's that same sense of maybe on the other hand, we could say to Akila, you're both fully Pakistani and fully German. But, yes, um, you are whatever you want to be. That's the whole point. That's what I learned. You are exactly who you want to be. And then uh, Sal Mohamed chipped in and said this was a generous, gracious response to some people's insecurities and prejudices. But here's a question from, and I may be pronouncing this wrong, but Faroza, or maybe that's pronounced a different way, but saying, going back to that leaked report, and this may be our last question, but was really damaging and emphasised a factionalism that also propagates racist attitudes. I don't feel that this is being acknowledged as serious within the PLP. It feels that there's just a view to put aside factionalism and carry on. However, this doesn't get to the heart of the issues of investigating and kicking out racism, Islamophobia within the top structures of the Labour Party. Fighting for justice and fighting racism shouldn't be a left-right centre issue, but an issue to be addressed at the heart of the Labour Party. So this is this report that came out last week that suggested yeah. there was, you know, some people perhaps were dragging their feet over this issue for, in order to do down a rival faction. No, it's been taken really seriously. I mean, I'm obviously on all of the PLP WhatsApp groups and emails, and we've had PLP meetings. It's, it's been taken hugely seriously. Um, but what we don't want to do, I think, I assume, is play all this out in the media because that's what did us a disservice before. Um, I think Keir wants a thorough investigation as to exactly what's happened. Um, also, one of the main reasons we can't talk about it too much is because there was lots of personal information in there, including information about minors, people's children. Um, so there is, a, there is an information issue with regards to legality of what's allowed to be talked about so it's a lot more complicated than it might seem but the plp are up in thank you i think probably at the oh big, big one final message from arik chowdhury saying he's a big fan of jonathan's bookshelves so that's nice um <laughs> good response um i was going to say on that note but also on the on the note of where you've taken us, uh, Rosanna, in this really interesting conversation. Uh, Taweed saying, Rosanna's an inspiration. Always enjoy hearing her speak. We need more Thank diversity you. and sensible people like her. It's been a really fascinating uh, hour, uh, certainly for me. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks to everybody who sent in um, various messages and questions and appreciation of Rosanna. And uh, also very much, I think I speak probably for everyone, for your work on the front line returning to the health service, Rosanna. Huge gratitude. Um, uh, on behalf of everyone for that. Uh, so on that note, just finally to say to you, Rosanna Alim Khan, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really, really grateful for you giving up part of your Sunday, uh, you know, to listen to my story and what I have to say. It, it, it's still sometimes, um, I'm just baffled that anyone could be interested by what I have to say. So it's a real honor, uh, to, you know, to be here. And 
honestly, if, if you take one thing from this, just know that there are just there are some really normal people in politics, and I, I count myself one of them. And um, you know, I'm I'm here for you. If any of you want want to reach out ever, my door is always open. I'm really proud to be part of the Concordian team now, and I'm really hoping that I get to meet as many of you as possible in in you know in the future. So thank you so much for hosting this. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. Thank you. To echo my thanks to both Jonathan and Rosanna. Uh, that was very, very fascinating. Um, Jonathan, you, you asked some very, very interesting and insightful questions. And, and Rosanna, I feel like I know so much more about you. Very <laughs> And we Thank look you. forward to you joining us, hopefully both of you joining us in person at, our, at, at one of our future physical events, hopefully. Inshallah. Thank you. I would like that. that Thank would you be great. Love that. Thank you. Thank you so now much, Jonathan, as well. Thanks Thank you. Much. Now it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our next couple of speakers. Um, Imam Shahab Webb, of course, needs no introduction.